why don't I just kind of get the ball rolling and uh, introduce you real quick and we'll go from there. Uh, Chase Barber has a passion for trucking that led to his creation of Edison Motors, a Canadian company that has made headlines in 2023 by building Canada's first production electric hybrid truck, or I guess diesel electric. Um, Edison Motors focuses on manufacturing electric hybrid trucks and EV conversion kits, emphasizing fuel efficiency and eco-friendly friendliness that allows the power of electric motors coupled with the efficiency of diesel generators for range, fuel efficiency, longevity, and multi-purpose use. And the multi-purpose use is uh, pretty cool, actually. That's um, There's a lot of outside-the-box applications that um, you've been touching on on your social media that uh, is pretty cool when it comes to like backup generators and how you can use that for, man, really, the sky's the limit, isn't it? It is. I think it's... There's no limit to what it could be. And it, it's one of those things that like now that we've done it, like we keep asking ourselves, why has nobody else done this? Like it, we've shown it works. We've shown it incredibly torquey. We've shown that there's fuel savings, like all the different ranges and like different jobs that you can do. Like there's different like things like a hydrovac truck where you can roll out on a job site. A lot of hydrovac work is residential. They do a lot of utility locating in residential areas. And that the biggest complaint is that a hydrovac is revved right up trying to dig holes in the ground. Yeah. Well, how do you, like, that annoys people. So you can run in a hydrovac, dig a hole in the ground on electric power, and then you fire up your generator once you're out of the residential neighborhood. But you're quiet, or much quieter. The blower's still loud. But the same as like a concrete mixing application. There's times where if you're running a concrete batching plant, you want to keep that plant running 24 hours a day. You don't want to do a big pour for 16 hours and then let it sit for eight hours halfway no. through the pour. You want to keep pouring 24. <laughs> but a lot of cities, they put in noise bylaws. No diesel engines after 10 o'clock at night or 8 o'clock at night, whatever it is. And they're like, well, how do we get a permit? And those permits are a nightmare to get. And it takes, it's, it's a huge part of the problem is like, hey, we can't run a diesel engine. We can't do this without the permit. Well, with the electric, one of our trucks, you could roll in there, completely quiet on electric, unload on electric, leave the residential area on electric, fire the generator on the way back to the batching plant. Like there's so many cool, unique applications that applies to the vocational side. They're like, how come this hasn't been done? This is this technology should have been here. It, it shouldn't have taken a bunch of loggers up in the yeah. to figure this out. Obviously, it comes from an un unlikely uh, source, but you're right because the technology isn't really new. Um, an example, I guess, a little bit more locally is in uh, Tumba Ridge. They have uh, the coal mines, and uh, these trains to transport a lot of the coals have to go through the mountain. So diesels don't really work because of the grade and uh, the terrain. You need to keep a, a nice steady torque on uh, on the rail. And then, of course, in addition to that, the, these tunnels are so long that emissions like you'll end up choking on the exhaust. So they've got electric uh, trains that go all the way into Tumba Ridge. They can load the coal. They come all the way back out. And uh, that technology was taken from a lot of the European trains. I mean, the speed, the efficiency. Um, I mean, even going down to the the coal mines, uh, diesel electric. I mean, some of the biggest equipment out there that needs the most amount of power is diesel electric. And uh, even yeah. down to like how you started, I, I like how the story that you told about uh, remote power and the peaks and the valleys of uh, power consumption and how you were able to generate uh, power off of a diesel engine, and then you coupled it with the batteries to be able to provide power that was reliable for some of these remote communities. Like it's, uh, it's kind of surprising that it was so common and then nobody thought about it until you did. And then everybody's just like, well, how come we haven't had this uh, earlier, right? <laughs> but do you yeah. mind tell, tell us oh. a little bit about how you, how you got that going? Well, we, uh, we started off as a trucking company and then we got into like hauling logs and then we did low bedding and then we started hauling equipment and then the equipment moved into generators. Then we realized like, well, beyond just generators, like we could make a lot more money if we installed the generators rather than just trucking the generators to site. Okay, well, let's do that. 
And then Eric, my business partner, who is incredibly, incredibly brilliant, we were looking at this one community, little First Nation community, way up in northern BC, and they wanted us to put in a 95 kilowatt hour generator. And we're thinking, like, that's pretty big for a small town of like 50, 60 people. And he said, Let, let's have a look at your power usage. Tell, tell me how much you're using. And we found out that they had an average load of 20, but then they would have a peak load of 70 kilowatts. And then you put a 95 to make sure that you have a little bit of extra capacity so you never overload the system. Yep. <clears throat> but so essentially, you're putting in a 95 kilowatt hour generator to meet 20 kilowatt average demand. That's super inefficient, but you had to just to make sure you had that peak load. So instead, what we said is like, well, let's meet that peak load with batteries. We put in a large battery bank put solar in in the summer because that's amazing in the summer up north where you got 24 hour daylight in the almost in the summertime perfect and then yeah the generator we downsized it to 35 so it could always meet the base load in a little bit but then we just put in a battery the battery met the peak load demand i think we billed one hundred and forty thousand dollars for the project and i think they ended up saving about eighty five thousand dollars in fuel the first year and we oh, built 140, wow. but you got to remember that it would have been 90 before. So we only built $50,000 extra to do this hybrid system. And they saved $85,000 worth of fuel in the first year. So it pretty well was like a seven month payback period. And then the nice thing is they could run off totally off battery and solar in the, the summertime, or they would have times where the generator would be shut off and It'd be the first time that like that valley was quiet, that they weren't listening to an old generator barking right in the middle of the community all day long, just listening to the drone of a diesel. Like that was so cool. Now, don't get me wrong. That project was a nightmare. It was by far our first yeah. project. <laughs> Learning curve. The words on that side, I regret doing it. But it worked. We, we had to go up there like three, four times. We got it working. We got it figured out. And that was our first foray really into the hybrid system. Well, how did you make that transition from a project like that, which is actually pretty uh, unique because not many people are able to, the idea and the application makes sense for sure. But then going from transporting the equipment to a remote area and then knowing where to source out the batteries, uh, the wire harnesses, the whole installation and the project of something like that is a little bit of an undertaking all on its own. Uh, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not too sure too many people would want to tackle that just because they wanted to prove they could, right? <laughs> but uh, clearly uh, you are for sure. But where did that kind of transition into where like, hey, why don't we actually start this with um, logging trucks and get into the, the heavy equipment and aspect of it? Well, it was kind of, we, like being logging, I thought the Tesla semi in theory made sense. So you could go uphill empty, you come downhill loaded, use the regenerative braking as you're coming down to recharge the batteries. I'm like that's pretty neat. That makes sense for logging. I'm like, that's definitely not a logging truck. And I'm like, so how would I modify it? Well, I would increase the ground clearance, like relocate the batteries up a bit higher, uh, do this, this, this. And you're like, and I'd probably put a little range extender. And I'm like, wait, we we were already a trucking company and we already been restoring all of these classic trucks. So it's like, well, we're restoring classic trucks. We're doing hybrid power systems. Why don't we just build a hybrid truck? How hard can it be? Turns out very extremely hard, <laughs> but insanely hard, but we, we did it. <laughs> yeah. I'd say you did it. Holy man. Knocking it out of the park. Like it's uh like for me, if I was to do it, I'm thinking, well, where does a guy get the batteries from? And then the motor and then the application and spare time, the cost, the whole, everything that goes into it. Like, that's just a hell of a, to go from an idea to the application. Like, did you, did you sell that idea and then just say, Hey, I'm um, looking for investors. Or did you think it would be a fun project to try and put something like this together and prototype awesome. it? My biggest thing that I'm thankful for is that like I said what the idea was and it was a crazy idea and we thought it was, Honestly, we thought it was going to take years to get a first truck built and how are we going to and we'll fund it off. The... And then basically we had a thing where we did a little bit of crowdfunding and we raised like $450,000. Uh, 
And I'm like, hey, if you buy a hat, you get some a few shares in the company and we'll go for it. And that got us enough money to build the first truck. But the most important thing, is, too, to our success is that so many people reached out to help. Right now, there's been over 130, 140 people now that have mm. contributed and worked on this project, given their time, their advice. Like people that say, like, hey, I'm an electrical engineering expert. Hey, I'm a suspension expert. Hey, I'm a heavy duty mechanic. Let me come help. Like we really just we all got together. Like I, I could not have done this company on my own. I cannot emphasize like. I, I do a lot of the posts and I know a lot of the stuff and like I said of that, but it's really just the uh, absolutely amazing people that came out to just help support this project and help get it off the ground. But well, man, you, you struck a chord for sure there, didn't you? Like, I, was that, a little, that must've been surprising. How did you manage that with uh, saying, Oh, this is an idea. And then there's a lot of behind the scenes managing it and actually being able to utilize some of that resource and, you know, manpower to be able to coordinate it all. Oh, I need a wiring harness or a spec done here. And then that must have been all on its own trying to scale up to match well, the kind of help. I, uh, I've got a theory and it, it's like, I'm dumb. I, I don't know a lot. I'm like, I am a truck driver at a core. But I just, I know enough to know that I don't know anything. Like, I'm not an expert in high voltage. I'm not an expert in truck suspension. So I figured that my job as CEO is just, find the people that are the experts and then listen to what the experts recommend. And then I, I balance, okay, well, what does this guy say? Well, what does this guy say? Well, okay, well, these are some decent ideas. I'll go with this. And that's, the, that's been my whole role at the company is just finding the people that are really, really much more brilliant than me, connecting them with the other brilliant people and then letting brilliant people make a brilliant truck and Makes i just I'll facilitate it because i'm just like at the end of the day i'm a truck driver so are you still selling shares with a purchase of a hat no 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 that, 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 <laughs> yeah. the government says we're not allowed to do that not in honestly, the... I, we got an ethos too like we raised the 1.5 million once we built the first truck we raised one and a half million to build the next truck in a week Wow. And we're still going on that money because, like I said, I believe in like too many EV companies, they're spending other people's money. They raise way more money than they need to. And then they put on way more staff than they need to. And they have fancy offices and huge $300,000 a year salaries for the CEO and team. And like, no, no, I made my salary $1,000 a month. I uh, lived in my, like, this is my parents' house. I'm living in my parents' basement. Uh, we work out of my parents' house, out of their backyard, and we're still oh, going man. one and a half million after building the truck. So, like, we've just lived incredibly frugally. We haven't needed to go back and raise money. So we're only taking what we need to get us to the next finish line. And that's kind of our whole ethos is too many companies get too greedy, and it becomes about the money, not about the truck. If I could fist pump you, I would. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty good. Uh, let's let's uh, let's show everybody on your website some of the timelines, just to put things into perspective of where the starting point was, to kind of where you are now, because it's actually it's rather impressive. I, I think it's a, a feat of accomplishment. So this is on your website, uh, like under who we are, like you can see here. You've got December 2021, Edison Motors announced, uh, you, you announced to the public. So this is probably where you're selling those hats. I wish I would have been in on that. And then uh, July 2022, uh, Edison built North America's first electric logging truck. And then it just goes down here in, in some uh, short timeline details. But we're, we're all the way up to November 2023. We can jump down to there. Edison oh, Motors sold their first production truck. So you you went from, like, I mean not even full two years to like just proof, like a, an idea to pretty much you've got a production truck already on the road. Yeah. And the cool thing, we haven't even announced it publicly yet on any of our social medias. Cause I'm just waiting to get, finally get it, but I, I got something real cool. Let me come back. Yeah, sure. While you're over there, I'm just going to keep scrolling through this website because there is a pile of information here. Those who aren't uh, watching and they're just uh, listening on the audio, um, go to the website there. It's edisonmotors.ca. Well, here we go. Here, check this what out. 
B, have a license plate, inspection. So we've got registration, insurance, a VIN number, and an actual license plate nice. for our that we made, which means that we have passed all the government tests we needed to pass. We, uh, we're heading up there on Thursday to go put the license plate on, and then we can actually drive. So we met all the testing, product testing, driving, safety inspections, which means that we have made our own truck from the frame rails up that passed the government test that it needed to do to be on the road. So as of just a few short days ago, we officially became an OEM manufacturer that built our own cab and chassis. What? Like what? I, the amount, like that is a feat. Like we're talking dealerships where you've got, I mean, all the regulations and testing and how did you manage that? How did you oh, manage all like, of that? That fucking sucked. There's no way to say that that sucks <laughs> so much. I am, people are like wondering, and they're like, hey, you did Topsy, and like we hauled uh, DeBoss Garage's uh, Sherman tank there. And they're like, where's the more testing? How come you're not driving it on the road? Be like, do you know how much paperwork is involved that you have to submit to prove that you built a vehicle that's safe to be on the road? And I'm like, there wasn't a lot of content. Because I basically was spending 14, 15 hours a day just at the computer with a bunch of other guys at the computer. Submit this, submit this. Like there was probably like 10 people helping to just get this truck across and submit things. And that that sucked. But we Man, did it. And it's I, done. I, I can't even imagine the nightmare. So where does that have to get done? Is that in, in BC? Do they or do you have to go to Ontario for something like that? Or Oh, that's a, even that's a lot of like, how come that's not standardized? So. We went, sent it off to Ontario because we had some great partners to go through all like fault detections, wiring harness issues, performance issues, integration issues that that a lot of the vehicle testing, making sure that it worked the way it was supposed to work was all done in Ontario. But then we had to send it back to B.C., for the VIN number to be applied and the final safety inspection, or basically the oh. final safety inspection at a certified BC, because we submitted the paperwork in BC, we had to get the VIN number stuck onto the vehicle in BC. In so BC. we did all the testing for everything. In Ontario, we had to ship it back so that we could do the final safety test. And basically, you, like, you submit all the parts you have, and like these are all the parts we use. This is what the suspension, the brake lines, everything, yada, yada, yada. And there's just giant binders to go through. And then the inspectors come out, and they're like, okay, well, yes, it met the performances. It's, it's working. It's driving. It's doing like it should. We just got to make sure that all the parts you said you used are there, that they're all correct. And with that giant stack of books that took them about five weeks, I think it was, or four or five weeks to go through there piece by piece, part by part to make sure even after all the driving, performance, braking, generator, throttling, all of that was already done. So that was, that was wow. a time. Like, Does that kind of restrict you now with your ability to be able to, um, I don't know. I don't want to say retrofit, but like, are you kind of stuck to a certain um, structure now? Like you have to use certain parts from a certain manufacturer because all of how you built this truck to OEM standards are with their approval. And if you go outside of those parameters, it, it's not really recognized and you go through a new approval process or how does that work? <laughs> There's low volume manufacturers where you do have to submit like, yeah, these are the parts. And then you go beyond that. There's a next step, which is a different level of certification where you can build more. And like, luckily truck manufacturers are more self-certifying than they are in, um, uh, in the car market where like, you don't have to do like crash testing, for example, as a small truck manufacturer, you don't need mm. airbags. You just have to meet the minimum requirements and you submit your build parts list. And then after the first time, it gets easier. So we've been told that it gets much easier after the first time you do something. But you know what? That we'll would, figure out. That would have been my concern is that uh, you get four oh, sorry. semi truck. Oh, sorry. Oh, we're kind of going. A little disclaimer, I'm on uh, Starlink, uh, Elon Musk. I don't know if that's a conflict of interest with you because it's getting all glitchy now. I don't know what's going on. 
<laughs> I've, I've, got, I've got Starlink. It's, it's, it's wicked awesome. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, so, no, I, what I was saying earlier was, I guess, uh, if if I was to get approval, I would have been a concern because if, let's say, you have an, an electric motor or, or maybe batteries or, or just something off the shelf, if it's now with, I guess, the approval of a certain part or service provider or, or whatever that might be, um, then they kind of got you. They'll be like, well, you need my stuff. Uh, guess what? Uh, 20% markup now because uh, you don't really have a choice, right? But I think the opposite is true just from watching some of your uh, videos is that the fact that you're getting a lot of the off-the-shelf parts that are fairly easy and in inexpensive is giving you the freedom to be able to kind of go out and, and build a lot of these pretty much, well, basically anywhere in North America, I believe, anyway. Yeah, we don't have $1,800 specialized headlights that are just made by us specifically for the truck. And if you plug a different headlight in, it won't work. Or Just the goofy shit you see, Matt. And it's also why I, I think we've got a better chance of getting to production. Because a lot of the issues, like we spend a lot of time talking with people from other EV companies or other production companies. And they use specialized components. Well, if you have a special, let's say, DC to DC inverter made just for your company, just specifically that goes in there, that the commuter, computer talks exactly with the other computer. And if you don't have that, the vehicle doesn't work. Well, guess what happens if you're running a super complicated production line and that one manufacturer that makes that specific inverter for you goes down? Well, it takes a long time to get somebody else to step up to the plate. But if your parts are relatively common, they're off the shelf. Well, okay, well, this guy's inverter went down. Well, let's just go with this guy's. All right, I'll, I'll run over there and I'll grab that guy that makes that inverter and we'll plug it in there. And we'll just leave a spot that it can drop in. And like, it's not a specific to us made for Edison Motors. It's just a DC to DC. They, a lot yeah. of different make those. You just got to pick the one you want. And that, like, that's, I think that's one of our secrets to getting to production for as cost effectively and efficiently as we have. We're talk. You're talking about uh, having to get approval now, like on the federal government end of things. Um, you just recently got uh, a tremendous uh, shout out and, and voice of support provincially, didn't you? You came back from the legislature, and and I seen some of those posts, and I'm telling you, I couldn't. I thought it was a pretty cool win as far as you know what happened there. Can you tell tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So that was one of those things where. Honestly, we were struggling to stay in BC. There, as you guys know, like in housing prices have been insane. And that directly translates to commercial property where we were struggling to find a place to build them. Like I'm building them right now behind my parents' house. That's not long-term feasible for production. So we reached out, like this is how just absolutely screwed up this province is. So there's about 80 acres of bare industrial land in Merritt, BC. And we approached like, hey, what can we do with that? And they're like, oh, it's owned by these people. Reach out and that person, which is owned by a foreign holding company. No comment on which company, country that's from, but I think we know. <laughs> um, and they, all, they all own all 80 acres. And we're like, hey, can we buy some of those acres? And they said, no we're not going to sell any for at least the next 15 years because we expect the value to be here. Merritt is great. It's strategically located between Kamloops, Kelowna, Vancouver. The prices are going to go way up once Merritt starts growing. It's going to become a hub. People are going to move businesses there. It's fantastic. But that's every piece of industrial acre. And 10 years ago, eight, 10 years ago, the city of Merritt set this property aside as an industrial park. Literally, they took it out of the crown land, out of the municipal holdings, set it aside as an industrial park so that Merritt could grow. What happened was is that the main sawmill in town went down. About 400 people, 500 people lost their jobs. And the city, to combat that, set up an industrial park where businesses could come in and grow and hopefully rehire those people. Well, they sold the property and it all got bought up by a foreign holding company that hasn't built a single goddamn building in the last 10 years. So we've had no increase in jobs. All we've done is made some asshole that lives somewhere else an incredible shit ton of money. We went to the city and we're like, hey, they're not selling it. 
here's the emails to prove that they're not selling it. Can we get some like more in that land? Like, can you set aside a piece just for us? And they said, sorry, we're not, we have a policy. We can't set aside any more land until the land we set aside the last time is already in use. So basically you're hamstringing the entire town from any industrial activity for 20 years. And we're like, what the fuck do we do? The more we looked into every different town, it was a very, very similar situation in every town. They would have available land, they would have bare land, but some property developer bought it just to sit on that industrial land. Wonder why we don't wow. have the jobs. And then, so the, but Nevada reached out to us out of Elko and they said, hey, we are willing to give you 100 acres of land completely free. You'll have no property taxes for 10 years and you'll have a discount on your state taxes for the next 15 years. We're going to give you a reduced rate. If you're willing to take those high tech jobs and relocate them to Nevada, bring them from Canada, bring them down to the States. We're going to be willing to give you all this. Like that's what Americans want to do. Wow. to support. Them. So we were going to go down to Nevada and then Ellis Ross, um, the MLA for Terrace, I think, I think he's now moving into federal politics from what I've heard. He is. He, he, yeah. Yeah. He is. Which is a, Great guy. Absolutely fantastic. Brilliant guy. He's like, no, no, no. Let's uh, let's figure out a way to keep you guys here. He wrote us up a fantastic letter of support and be like, what can the community do? Like, what, what can we do to get balls rolling? And we talked to like the city manager and we found an old shop that it hadn't been used in like 15, 20 years. It was the old truck production shop for hay uh, for, yeah, for Hayes. You know the Hayes logging trucks? They're XC. They're oh, yeah. Trucks. Yeah, they yeah. were made, a bunch of them were made in Terrace and this one little factory that hasn't been used in 20 years. And it was zoned commercial, not industrial. So he's like, well, how do we got to rezone this? Like it hasn't been used in 20 years because it's clearly an industrial building. Why the hell did city council zone a commercial? Like it's a 27,000 square foot factory, truck production factory. Who's going to open up a fucking coffee <laughs> shop in this guy? Like, get off your ass, rezone it. And like, we can get it. If we rezone it and we redo this, we can probably get Edison Motors into Terrace. We can probably keep them in BC. The price point was good enough that we were able to make an offer. We could afford it. We, we bought it off the original, like 90 year old owner. Fingers crossed. There's it, it, it hopefully is going through. We've submitted all the paperwork. We still are dependent on the city saying yes we approve the zoning but fingers crossed but uh, we submitted the offer to buy it from the original owner that owned it when it was still the hayes truck factory he's in his 90s like it's just a combination wow. of people knowing the right people to facilitate things getting done but that's what we had to do just to stay in this province is move like 16 hours north of here well welcome north not quite as far north as I'd like to see, but, you know, one thing about Ellis Ross that I'd like to try and highlight too a little bit is because is, is instead of having, I think, the provincial government trying to work in favor for being able to address the problems and stimulate economy and everything else, they seem to stifle it. And I don't understand the full reasoning behind it, but what is a breath of fresh air is when you have an MLA, whether he's in government or official opposition or anything actually see an opportunity that's going to benefit the region at the province. Well, really everybody. And they use the position they're in to be able to actually come with an approach of rational problem solving to make it happen. And I, and I think you're going to probably see some of the hurdles in the red tape being addressed, but at least now it's in, a, it's in a different approach. Some of these hurdles, no matter what you got to address, but it's a whole lot easier when you've got the support and the backing of, you know, our elected officials instead well, that, of the roadblocks and all the other crap that kind of stifles all these. Yep. That's what we should have for MLAs. Like that's what MLA should be doing is that, yeah. Hey, look, this is a, a grassroots company that started in the province. They have this new tech that's kind of revolutionary. Like it, it's changing it. They're making like, how do we support keeping them there? They should be like, Hey, how do we make sure we keep these manufacturing? How do we, attract companies like what look at what nevada is doing like tesla opened up a gigafactory in nevada because of like how willing they are to work with things it gets the it get brings in good jobs brings in high paying jobs yeah like that, 
that's that kind of thing that like they should be looking after their community that way. Not just, I, I don't know. I don't like throwing people under the bus, but you can see that the current government is, um, well, let's just say that it, it's not the same. They're just throwing money at things. Like, let's look at grants. We've applied for a bunch of grants, BC government grants for commercial clean truck innovation. Never gotten a single piece of government grant, but all of our foreign competition is all getting these BC government grants. Well, it's not going to any local company trying to do anything. And I've talked with other business owners that are in the same position as Edison that have amazing technology. They don't have the social media reach that we do, but they've been, they're doing amazing things in their own field. And we're like, oh, how, do, how did that grant go? We didn't get it. Well, who got it? Oh, a bunch of foreign company or this multi-billion dollar company got it, this multi-billion dollar company. And they're just leaving these grassroots company behind because essentially the government is just like, and I asked when I was down there, I'm like, like, what's going on with these? And they're like, oh, we don't know. We just kind of set aside and then somebody else kind of handles it. We don't look into where the money's going. And they're like, well, as MLAs, you should be looking and be like, is the money going to support people in my community that I represent? Or is it going to support a billion dollar industry somewhere else? Yeah. Like, that's what these MLAs should be doing. They should be looking at the money and like, hey, I'm a representative of Thompson Nicola. Are these air grants and this government subsidy going to support members from Thompson Nicola, the businesses or the community thing, um, community engagement events that I'm supporting that are going to help my community? Or is it all going to go to SNC Labelin? Is it all going to go down to Nicola down in the States? Like where, where's the money going? Yeah. And if the answer is our taxpayer money is all going to China, which you know how many grants I have seen where the money just straight up goes to China. And you're like, okay, I think China's got enough money. China yeah. probably has an edge on electric vehicles and technology. Like China is winning when it comes to high speed rail, uh, electric vehicles. Like they're, they're doing good. We, we don't need to support them with our taxpayers. How about we support our own communities? Well, there's definitely, I think, a little bit of lobbying and, and other things happening. And, you know, when you said, I don't want to throw people under the bus, I agree with that for sure. But there's also something to be said about just calling it as it is, too. And if people are acting at uh, the interest of themselves and maybe special lobby interests, call it out. And, you know, an accusation is uh, obviously based off of perception. And if you're getting the roadblock and, and all the excuses, like we said earlier, about getting stifled, and then you've got special interest groups or contracts being awarded to people out of country, um, I think there should be a lot more emphasis on trying to stimulate local economy, which is kind of a benefit to everybody, including your country, than uh, foreign, foreign policy or money. I mean, that example that you just ta told me about there with the 80 acres and merit, I mean, that's an example of just what are you supposed to come to the conclusion of? It's definitely not for the interest of anybody local or the province when you're having to go up against, you know, scenarios and roadblocks like that. No, but, and like, why aren't they doing something? Like, when we started a trucking company, we moved up to Watson Lake. And there we bought 10 acres of land for $6,000, I believe. This is about eight years ago, nine years ago. And the mine closed down and we had to move out of Watson Lake. Um, okay, we lost our mine contract to haul for the mine. Mine closed down. But the government said, well, if you're not using that property, then in the clause, we're going to take it back. We buy it back for $1. That's similar to what like, Nevada does is that, hey, and Nevada put the same thing in there. We could have the acres of land. We could use that for free. It's ours but they have first right to buy it back for $1 as soon as we stop using it. So we can't sell it to somebody else. We can't stop. And if we don't use it for two years, Hey, you guys haven't had any employment. You haven't had any jobs. Like what's going on. It's been two years. We're going to take it back. And then we're going to take that land and factory. And we're going to find another business that wants it. That can bring those jobs in to replace the jobs that you just laid off two years ago. And we're going to re-stimulate it and give it to somebody else. Like, Wow. Why are we doing things like that? Like, why isn't yeah. that a clause that's in there when it says, hey, we're taking 80 acres of crown land. The mill yeah. just shut down. We lost four or 500 jobs. We need to get Merit going again. We need more businesses. We're going to take this industrial park. 
why aren't they putting a clause in there for the people that buy it that says, hey, you can't buy the whole fucking 80 acres and just sit on it for 25 years. <laughs> you buy it. And if within a year or two years, if you're not working and producing, or at least if you're not submitting building permits, if you're not building the building, if you're not doing anything with the land at all, you lose it. Sorry, yeah. tough shit. You get zero dollars back. It goes back. We offer it to the next guy who can do something with it. Like, why aren't we doing that at the very least? Or put it at the very like put in a hundred percent tax on it. Be like, hey, you're not using it. You got to pay fifty percent, hundred percent of the value of the property every year in tax until you do something with it. In other words, sell it to somebody who will. But no, I love that. I'm glad you're bringing uh, that up, and and a guy can kind of bring some more awareness around stuff like that i think that's the only way there's going to be uh, a little bit more change with stuff like that not many people are aware of those issues and the hurdles that a lot of people never really are aware of until they're in the process that you are of trying to actually grow or get established in in one way or another well there is a lot of people that you meet that are aware of these things that run small businesses but they don't have a reach to bring out the problems. They, they know a few friends and they can talk about a few friends, but they don't have the reach. And I don't know if the politicians just ignore them because they don't have a reach or the politicians really don't know what's going on, which I find hard to believe because I've brought up these issues to the government and they're like, well, nothing we can do. That sucks. Like, honestly, I think we need to like, just, we need more blue collar people in politics. Well, I just don't think they know what's I going agree. on, what it actually takes to grow the country anymore. There's a there's a disconnect there for sure. And I think part of the problem is there's been such a withdrawal from people. Politics is very, I mean, it's kind of a, a gross, nobody's really into it. But I think a lot of people are starting to uh, realize that there's been a huge withdrawal and that vacuum has been filled with bad actors. And I think a lot more people are trying to get reengaged and um going back to maybe that shout out that you gave to Alice Ross. Um, it's nice to be able to give the acknowledgement to the very small amount of people who are going a little bit out of their way to make sure that opportunities like what you're, you're getting in Terrace and, and on a lot of other subjects um, are being done because they're kind of putting themselves in a line of fire or at the very least, it's a little bit of an extra workload and uncomfortable out of the mainstream kind of way of doing business. And so doing a shout out and showing that recognition, I think is also important too, when you see people doing good and, and then you make it a known so that it gives them the power to be able to keep doing what they're doing. Yeah. And Instead I, of them just saying, well, what the so, hell am I doing this for? Nobody really likes it anyway. Right. Well, exactly. Like I, I do like saying things where credit is due and we've had, there are some genuinely good politicians that we have met. Like Ellis Ross, and it's too bad he's going federal and not representing us up in uh, Terrace anymore. That is a tragedy from ourselves personally. I'm uh, going to be great federal, but then there's there's some other people like Jackie Taggart here has always had our back for Edison Motors. Like Sonia from the Green Party, fantastic. She is. I've done a. I respect her. I don't always agree with her necessarily, but I respect her so much because I've done videos where I've criticized her and she picked up the phone and she phoned me and said, I'd like to talk about that. Like you had a viewpoint. Cause I had a viewpoint that like, Oh, that's an interesting theory. Like, okay. It was about LNG and I'm like, okay, but we are shutting down coal plants in China. So even though we increase our CO2 production, the reduction from coal plants in China is, and she talked and she put her aside and like, there's parts that I agreed with and, it, but I respect that a lot because that is, and she has been a fan. She has been supportive. It's just the current government, like the NDP wants absolutely nothing to do at all with anybody that started up a small business. And that's, they've made that very clear that they are not interested in helping us. And that's, it, it, it's really sad. It, it just is. Yeah, I'm going to show a couple of pictures here of the, the ones that you met, if you don't mind. Yeah, Because uh, I think it's cool to, awesome. there's Alice there. And then who else uh, is with you? Because there's uh, someone on either side of uh, you and Alice there. Who are those? Oh, extra yeah, two? those are some of the other uh, original founders of Edison. We got Theron awesome. um, and we got Ray Ma uh, Matkin on the other side. They're just, they came down with me to 
meet everybody. We got Fair. criticized massively on that photo. They're like, why didn't you put on a nice suit meeting with these people? Uh, <laughs> They're like, you went down to Parliament and you wore yeah. plaid and blue jeans. Yeah. Uh, I can see why. Okay, fair enough. But you're representing, right? Uh, that's well, the there you go. Here's another one with, with yeah. Alice. So who are these? This guy right here I recognize. That's our MLA, Mike Bernie, South Peace. And then oh, you've got... Yeah, yeah. Um, right, I'm Jackie Taggart's right to my right there, and then of course we got Alice. That, that's just the BC United guys. Met with them in their caucus, and so with the Green Party. Uh, before we move on, I, I found that a little surprising that uh, you mentioned the Green Party because, I mean, and this is probably showing my ignorance a little bit, but um, I thought when it came to provincial politics and the Green Party, they weren't really too interested in any variable or topics of conversation except for pretty much shut everything down. Let's on the position of virtue in one form or another, try and address pretty much the only thing that they care about is climate change. And, and there is nothing you can do to persuade them otherwise. And um, it's at the detriment of obviously the province and local economy quite often, usually, I mean, it's, it's cutting, cutting the hand that feeds you because they want to make sure that, you know, their voice is heard and the emergencies that they feel are very strong or to be accomplished at any cost. I think most people feel that. And so to hear the support, you know, that you were receiving from a green party is a little bit surprising for me. I don't want to go too political, but I mean, it's it, it, it was brought up and it's good to kind of mention that because I think that's a perception a lot of people have as far as, you know, that wince when it comes to Green Party. Yeah, I would. Um, that was always my perception until actually sitting down there and talking with them. And like, I guess that's kind of a bit of my ignorance, but like you talked with her and met with Sony and we like talked about how, yeah, there's a lot of trucks that can't go full electric. That, that's clearly what they want is a reduction full electric. But as they say, you, we got to have clean power on the grid to support those trucks. If we just made all the trucks electric, the grid wouldn't support it. Then what are we doing? Relying on coal power and diesel, more diesel generation power. Well, like the hybrid is a great transition because if we transition to hybrid, we can start putting in the electrical infrastructure for the trucks. We can start working on the batteries, getting people trained. We can show real reduction in diesel fuel by up to 50% reduction in fuel. That's a, if electric trucks only can do 10% of the market with their current range, well, 90% getting a 50% reduction aligns with their goals. Like, yes. <laughs> you said, uh, you it's need not a couple full of electric. It's not. But it's a great logical transition that they were very much in support of, that little bit of logical transition, whereas we found people in the NDP were the exact opposite. If it wasn't full, 100% yeah. green, zero emissions, no matter what, the NDP was not interested in it at all. But then you have the Green Party that's like, no, this is a logical transition. Like, yes, it still uses diesel, but it's going to get us to what our goals are. And like she said, is like, like – um paraphrase it a bit it was a long conversation but like environmental protection is a luxury good of something that you can have when your economy is doing really good you can afford to put solar panels on your roof when you're not worried about where the food in your fridge is coming from if people can barely afford rent can't afford a house how is somebody going to put solar panels on the roof of their house if they can't even afford the house they're, they're worried about putting food in their fridge to feed their family. They're not worried about what their carbon output is. We've got to fix our economy, make sure the economy is good so that we can afford to make the improvements we need to make for fighting climate change. And like, I, I agree with a lot of that. Like there, there's a lot in that Green Party that was very common sense that actually had some plans on how they were going to implement it. And I find that, I, I don't know what that says about the modern state of BC politics, when the Green Party is more rational than their NDP current party, but that, that's no, I uh... well, in fact, I guess <laughs> what we were talking about earlier for sure. I, but it's it's refreshing when common sense is the one to prevail because you're right, as far as at all costs, um, 
I don't think poverty is a very uh, environmentally friendly outcome. And there is a healthy transition. And a lot of the videos that I've seen you do, and I'm going to have to thank you for a lot of them, because I even shared a couple of them myself, fell out of, you know, what I was expecting to see when it came to seeing something about an electric truck. Uh, that one particular uh, where you're talking about, you know, the the coal being shipped out to uh, China, and then you ended it with, you know, those who feel that we just kind of do what we can within our own sandbox by not helping out other countries on a global scale. We're actually saving ourselves because the acid rain and you explain, you know, the jet streams and stuff. So that was extremely well put together and, and it, and it resonated. I agree with Sonia from the Green Party. She phoned me up. And she said, yes, it makes sense. And a global emissions reduction, it makes sense. She's like, one of my biggest oppositions is that, did you know when she did a video where she even replied after the phone and broke it all down and I, I shared and reposted it, um, that of that LNG project, 60%, I believe it was 40 or 60%, one of the two, was owned by the Chinese state oil and gas company. And in total, we were giving billions of dollars in subsidies and government funding for this project. So why the hell, when BC is struggling, is the BC taxpayer giving billions of dollars to the Chinese state oil and gas company to subsidize a product? If anything, China should be paying us for that natural gas. And then yeah. we could use that money to help make BC better. So why, are we sub why is the NDP government giving billions of dollars to China to push ahead of this project and like you know what i really really like i didn't know that she said that that's one of the large regions she was opposing this i didn't even realize that she had been portrayed as somebody that she's opposing it for crazy ideological things she's just a nut job green turns out she was opposing giving billions of dollars to the chinese oil and gas companies that believe it or not quite wealthy <laughs> Well, I would have never guessed that. <laughs> Who knew, right? Well, let's um, let's kind of talk about. Uh, I want to. We're getting close on time here, and I want to talk about a couple of the common questions now when it comes to. Um, let's hit on a few things here as far as uh, practicality. We can put it underneath that because I, I've been impressed with. A lot of the, um, I had a little bit of an outlook on on some of the concerns that I think a lot of people share when it comes to viability as far as um, extreme condition scenarios, uh, particularly up where where I live. And I think you can relate because you're in the logging and, and, well, you're in Canada, so you have a pretty good idea of extreme conditions as far as what that entails. And, and we're talking about 40 below where batteries typically freeze, 40 above where, you know, it's it's hard to be able to not overheat. You've got the mud, you've got the snow, you've got the dust, uh, rough roads. And when you're dealing with, um, you know, electric motors and generators that typically are kind of finicky when, when it comes to those such extreme conditions and, and thermal cycling, uh, batteries that typically don't have the range are prone to overheating or freezing. Um, just all of those variables, uh, that, that's kind of what caused me a moment of pause when I think about an electric vehicle, especially further up north where we are. Now, I've addressed a lot of these because i got to admit your, your social media presence and ability to explain a lot of this is extremely well done. Um, but... For the purpose of this podcast, um, let's kind of try and address at least a few of those variables, you know, and we can maybe start with the batteries in particular as far as um, longevity and cost effectiveness when it when it's like over a lifespan in the north and prone to either freezing in the winter, you know, or, or maybe even kind of getting a little bit too hot because of the, the transfer in power. Um, how have you addressed that or where is the real concern when it comes to with something like that? Uh, the Starlink kind of cut out for me there a little bit. What do you say? But you were basically saying I gathered um, how the batteries are effective in the cold in Canada. Yeah, let's go with that for sure. We'll yeah. start with that. Okay, so batteries, lithium iron batteries, you can use at any temperature below freezing. They discharge their energy fine. It's not like a lead acid where your capacity is reduced. The issue is you cannot charge those batteries below zero. 
that's that's the biggest hindrance is that below zero you can't put a charge into them so they use their own electricity to warm themselves up and then they use electricity to keep themselves warm because they do work a little bit better at zero um they use they have heat cells to keep themselves up at 40 below so like a tesla drives totally fine at 40 below but what you find is your range sucks and a lot of people think that well the range sucks because the battery sucks in the cold it's like when i'm trying to crank my car the battery is pretty well dead in the cold it's not like that why your range sucks is because 40 percent of your battery on an electric car in the cold goes towards heating like once you're at minus 20 minus 30 40%, 50% 40%, 50% of that battery power goes to keeping the cab warm and keeping those batteries warm in cells. So it's a huge parasitic load. Now, it's not a huge load overall, but it's enough of a load that it, it draws it down. Where That's where I say the hybrid solution works because I can just fire up that generator. Okay, well, I've got 40% more power, which isn't 40% more power in a semi-truck because the comparative load for heating versus moving the freight is much less. It's probably like closer to 5% of total power usage just due to the energy intensity of a semi-truck compared to a car. But with um, that generator, I got to run the battery or the generator an extra 5%, 10% per day in the wintertime. Like that's, that's not the end of the world. I just fire up the generator. It runs 10%, 20% more just as it keeps itself warm. And then we also have things like we've got glycol. Well, We've got diesel still. I can put a diesel-fired heater like a little Wabasso, keep that glycol warm in the batteries. I can use the electric heating on the batteries. I got diesel for cab heat. I got electric for cab heat. I mean, that's the whole thing why a diesel engine is so inefficient is that only like 20% of the actual power, the calorie value of the diesel fuel, goes to actually produce mechanical energy. The other 80%, 90% is all wasted in a form of heat energy. Which means that diesel is a very, very efficient heater, but a very inefficient power source compared to electricity where 95% goes to power, 5% goes to heat. So So, we use a diesel heater to keep it warm because that's already a really efficient heater. Kind of what I was hearing then is I guess what you've done is to offset the inefficiency of that battery to be able to take on a charge at 20 below you've got a glycol jacket that goes around the batteries and you use either a Bosto or engine heat to be able to keep that warm so that you're able to recharge. You're regulating the temperature of the batteries to maintain optimum temperature for it to be taking a charge and then obviously supplying a charge. Am I right in that? Is- yeah, essentially, instead of more like a blanket, it kind of flows through the batteries because you oh. already have glycol, like even a Tesla has the glycol. Because what you're trying to do when you're really working those batteries and the motor hard, you're heating up the batteries is a little bit as you take the power. So it's got liquid cooling and it just tries to take the, normally it takes the heat and tries to dissipate it away from the batteries. Then you get into an area where it's like zero degrees out and you don't need to take the heat away or not. The batteries are just doing okay. And then you get into minus 30 where you're actually trying to take heat. So instead of running through the radiator and trying to dissipate the heat, you are essentially keeping the heat in there and you're recirculating the heat to try and keep it warm. And then beyond that, and then it's got a um, electric heat pad. Like it's kind of similar to what you would put on the bottom of your oil pan on a diesel that you plug in. It's just a little bit fancier than that. It's a little like, yeah, little heat grid that heats it up in addition to that. So what about um, the lifespan of a battery? Like if you had an investment in, in batteries for one of these electric vehicles, how long would you expect something like that to be able to last versus the cost in having to maybe replace a lot of these batteries over maybe a one or two year, you know, deal if they caught like cost versus longevity for, for these batteries? Yeah. So between eight to 10 years, you're looking at a 50% capacity reduction in your batteries. Which means Mm -hmm. that if you had a 200 kilowatt hour battery, eight years later, 10 years later, you really have a 100 kilowatt hour battery effectively. They're just, they're weaker. Now, in a normal EV, that is a massive pain in the ass. Because if you had a run, say in a truck, and you could do 300 kilometers, well, now you can only do 150. 
Well, now your truck's too short to do the haul that you got it for. And actually, if you're pushing your max range at the start, well, all of a sudden, 20%, now you can't meet that final little leg of the distance because you're just pushing the maximum as it degrades. Now, with us, so we get about two hours of driving off of one hour of generating time. Like you drive for two hours on electric and then you drive for an hour off the generator and then two hours off electric. With a 50% reduction in battery, instead of driving for two hours off the battery, you're driving for one hour off the battery, which means that as a smaller battery, you're running the generator for half an hour instead of an hour. So you're just running shorter, more frequent generator power durations. You can't run off of just batteries as much. It means that the generator is a little efficient, but if you think about it that way, you can push that lifespan 10, 15 years before you're looking at a $30,000, $40,000 battery replacement. And oh, really, okay. So yeah, 30, 40 grand. But let's, be, let's be honest here. 10 years. How many people do you know with a 10-year-old vehicle nowadays? I mean, they're definitely out there, but I mean... Me. I've, I've got a few. <laughs> well, and I've got a couple too, but very few um, every 10 years... What I'm trying to point out, I guess, is in 10 years, if you got to spend ten or $15,000 on replacing your batteries, it's still a lot cheaper than a, what's a truck now? I mean, a pickup's oh, like a hundred and something thousand dollars. I mean, it's, a new rigged out logging truck is about $400,000. But yeah, you look wow. at it mostly is that within eight to 10 years, most people are looking at doing a rebuild. Like most truckers are trying to rebuild that X-15. X-15 rebuild run you about $50,000, $40,000, $50,000. Now, what's cool is that as a generator, we can push our rebuild time because it's running at one peak RPM. It's almost double the time frame. You can get 20 years out of a generator compared to 10 years out of a truck engine, which means that, okay, you're really looking at that $40,000 battery replacement. You're looking at a $40,000 engine rebuild. So the long-term maintenance cost on batteries is that you got to look, hey, 10, 15 years, you're going to have to start looking at a rebuild. The nice thing about it is that it's a little bit more predictable. A rebuild is mainly like, oh, I just dropped a liner. Oh, I just warped a head. Like, I've got a leak at head gas. If this is a problem that I need to deal with immediately, I better hope that as an owner operator, I got forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 sitting in my bank. As it's looking at battery degradation, you can look at somebody and tell them that, hey, just so you know, in two years, you're going to have to look at a forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 battery replacement in this truck in the next year or two. That gives them time. They can put away $500 a month, $1,000 a month, or probably $1,500 a month or so for the next few years, and then they can look at doing it. It's not a sudden $50,000, holy fuck, I sure hope I have the money. Like it, it gives people time to plan things, or they can time it like loggers. They like doing their work during breakup. Well, if you're, you crack a head gasket and you need a rebuild because your motor shits the bed, tough luck, you're doing that when you need it. With this, you're like, okay, I know I'm going to be down or I'm going to go on vacation for a week, take the family down to Disneyland. I'm going to just put the truck in. They can do the battery replacement. Then I'll come back with new batteries. I can all be planned out. That is really, really critical to the heavy vocational. Yeah. What about um, like the generator and... Uh, like the shroud or like how well protected is it from road grime or just basic overall elements that might affect your generator from getting gummed up and whatnot? Yeah, we learned that. So Carl had an open stator on the back end, which means that Carl, I can't even drive if it's raining, snowing, muddy, mucky, dusty, which on a logging truck probably limits its days a fair bit. So we went with another ones and they make IP67, IP68 rated generator back ends. They're all liquid cooled for their cooling, but they're entire waterproof, dust proof, enclosed units. So oh, okay. And what about the electric motors? Are they are they sealed units also? Same. They're pretty well the exact same as the generator end. Because an electric motor and electric generator on the AC side are basically the same thing. Okay defines on which way you're putting mechanical if you put mechanical energy in and you get electrical energy out as a generator if you put electrical energy in and you get mechanical mechanical energy out it's a motor and that's really the fundamental difference because other than that they're just a bunch of magnets spinning in copper wire there's no difference between a motor and generator so they're fundamentally pretty well the same thing 
So is that electric motor mounted to your axle and your differential so that it meets up and it creates a seal on the actual axle and you're not exposed and then you still have the ability to be able to have a differential where you can lock and, and you have power to each wheel but it's running at a, 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 like a conventional axle is that's right. Do I have that right okay yeah, that, you're bang on you got it um it's, it's well, not complicated stuff like we know it simple as we possibly could it's freaking it's i'm you're winning me over like in a big way so what about uh light end trucks like pickups uh you you've gotten uh, kits now with the axle that you can do retrofits on on pickups too that's right so we realized that we were using a lot we could use a lot of the same parts or er, actually what we realized is that we need to buy in bulk in order to take advantage of bulk pricing because once we buy in bulk the cost almost comes down in half and i'm like yeah, okay if well, we that makes get sense things to the market where we're affordable and get these trucks out. I'm like, how the fuck do we buy in bulk? Because a semi truck is such a big, massive thing. And then the other issue was how do we expand? Like, how do we grow it? We can use the installers. That's a different question. But so we looked at our thing and we we're like, well, what's the difference on a pickup truck? Really? Like other, the axles are smaller, but instead of using six or eight batteries, we're going to use two batteries. Instead of using six inverters, we can use two inverters. Same skew, same production of batteries, same inverters, same uh, PDU, uh, just a couple less points of connection. But if we can use all the same parts, all of the same BMS control systems, and we've already done the programming for the electric motors on how we program them all, why don't we just do the pickup? It'll be a lot cheaper because it's a lot smaller. But then we can start getting them out in volume where I can sell a lot more pickup trucks than I can semi trucks. But then I can all of a sudden now I can order batteries in bulk quantity, which means that my cost came down in like half. And now it's actually affordable to build all of them. So it, it was just a matter of setting up production, supply chains. And then we realized that on the heavy duty truck side, downtime is expensive. And one of the feedback we got when we were doing a lot of customers is that, okay, that's great, but you guys are all the way in BC. I'm up in Northern Alberta or I'm in Ontario or I'm down in Texas. How the hell am I going to get this thing serviced? Do I got to low bed the truck back to you? Do you got to fly down if, we, if it's something that my guys can't work on? And we're like, oh yeah, I guess you need a dealership and a service network in order to sell trucks across a North American face. And then we're like, we want to do retrofits too. And it didn't make sense to ship all the trucks of North America to merit just to do the retrofit, send them back. So I'm like, well, let's train Ma and Pa shops because I think Ma and Pa sh mechanic shops are getting pushed out in the electrification. Yeah. They're not being allowed to work on electric vehicles because companies are locking out people and they're trying to run those small shops out of business. So let's take those small shops. We'll train them up. I'll show them how to work on this equipment, service this electric equipment, train them up on how to install our kits and our products, and then they can go and then they can sell our products to their customers and then retrofit their trucks and improve their trucks, which means that we can order more parts, which means we get more discount, which means we get more things out there. And now we're getting people that are trained up, knowing how to deal with Edison stuff. And... Um, fundamentally at that point that our heavy duty commercial guys you're like well how am i going to get this service i'm in houston you're like oh perfect we actually have an installer that we've already trained on how to work on and service our trucks in houston they're like okay well that that makes me feel a lot better about this asset that there's going to be somebody local that's experienced with this so it was kind of just a win-win-win we get the small businesses going bring them in with the change with ev as we make that change we get uh, able to order large uh, quantities of parts and we're able to get our service network set up by using a distributed manufacturing production model. And I'm, I'm really excited about it too. Plus it's God, I'm getting fired up here. I, like, uh, I just don't want to interrupt because of our uh, connection here. It's a good thing because I, I would have been all over that. 
hooting and hollering. <laughs> it's exciting, man. I mean, it's super cool. I want to show a picture of like some of the dealership and locations that you've got here that you've, I took it off your website. I mean, look at all of these here. It's insane. Like I can't really zoom in with this picture, but it looks like you're all the way from, it's pretty much North America, basically U S and, and Canada that you've got all these dealership sites. Yeah, so far Alaska. All the way from These, Florida to Alaska, from uh, New Brunswick, all the way down to California. And... Well, and these are all small kind of uh, mom and pa shops, like you were saying, that uh, you've been able to sign up and offer these different locations for servicing and rig yeah, up, I guess. Yeah, they tend to be on the size of around 15, 20 employees, seems to be around the average, some more, some less. But yeah, the, the smaller shops that uh, want to learn, send a few guys up and interested in doing it. Like if, I, I've managed, I've been trying to meet and we've been trying to reach out to as many. Unfortunately, there's only so much time in my schedule. So we've had a couple of guys, we've got on a guy specifically to deal, start training. And But they're, uh, the ones I've talked to, they're a good group of guys. Really passionate, really motivated, really smart, just talented, talented uh, shops. When it comes to, uh, before we let the pickup thing go, um, especially four-wheel drive trucks, how did you get power to the front end? Like you just go through a transfer case, like where you normally have your drive shaft connected to engage and disengage the front end for power? Do you have like a separate motor for that? Or how did you... Yeah. Motor on the front and an electric motor on the back, a pusher and a puller. But so do you need a front axle then for uh, in a pickup or independent suspension, suspension and still... Yeah. We're at the size we're at. We're just saying that solid axles only like okay. the boss is doing up a truck for us and they've got independent front suspension and they're just going to put a conversion kit and drop the solid axle on there. But for right no. now to make sure that we can tackle as much as we can in this market, we're just doing solid, uh, solid front axles four by four. So we'll get there. But once you go independent suspension, it becomes a huge, there's, like with an axle, I just swap the axle, and the axle is the axle you get. With independent front suspension now, all of your little stub shafts and all that are all going to be different lengths depending on the vehicle and different arrangement. And no, no, not. That seems like a problem for the future. Change to work out. Fair enough, fair enough. So uh, what is one of the maybe one or two top questions that you seem to get quite often when it comes to that – you're repeated, repeatedly having to address when it comes to either accurate or misunderstood impressions of when it comes to electric vehicles. Um, one of the big ones is that like you can't work on electric vehicles, that it's not going to be reliable, that we get that a lot, is that these electric socks and it, it's not going to be reliable and you can't fix it like you can your old 1970s and Camaro. And you're like, what the hell? Are, like, no the only reason it's not reliable is because the big oems are saying that it's not reliable freight trains have been diesel electric since the 1930s laterno 1960s like you look at all of these sawmills industrial plants that all have electric motors electric motors are incredibly reliable controlling these things can be incredibly reliable you can get them with off-the-shelf parts the only reason they're not is because the big OEMs want to lock you in to just buying their parts from them and only getting serviced by them. They want to sell you the vehicle at almost a loss. And you can see that. Like you look at companies that selling vehicles at loss, like Rivian takes a $30,000 loss per truck, still worth $6 billion because they're planning on making that money on the back end when you lock into a vehicle. Yeah, They'll make the parts expensive. They'll make the service impossible by anyone else. And they'll lock you in and like, like I say, for commercial trucks, you don't throw out a $400,000 truck because of a $400 turn signal. Like, yes, I can buy a turn signal for 50 bucks. Old school turn signal that you would find in a 1960s, 70s trucks. 40 bucks, any parts store has it. An integrated one that's molded into the dash, that's all CAN bus and super complicated. Yeah, that, that turn signal is four or 500 bucks because they know you bought the truck. And you know they know you can't drive it out of turn signal, so they can charge you whatever the fuck they want. Charge eight hundred bucks, fifteen hundred bucks for a turn signal. Guess what? You'll pay it because you were not going to throw the whole truck out because of that, and you need it to go to work. 
Well, that's what we were talking about at the very beginning with the concern about, you know, some of the contracts that you got into, at least they're off the shelf and it gives you the, uh, the freedom to be able to do it yourself. And really at the end of the day, we, we're pretty accustomed. I didn't even realize how much of a throwaway economy mentality I had, right? I mean, we're kind of like that, oh, this sucks. It's a piece of crap. Let's go get, just get a new one. And uh, it's like that with just about everything. We're even getting into real estate where it's almost throwaway now. I mean, a house doesn't hardly last more than 15 years now anymore. But uh, that's good yeah. to, to address. A um, couple more uh, questions or things I'd like to hit if you're okay. How are we doing with time? I do got to run here relatively quick. I, yeah. I got what time is it? Uh, yeah, I got another meeting here in just a little bit to wrap things up for the day. Okay. Let's wrap her up. Uh, I want to hit on a couple of things that we had mentioned before we started recording. I'm going to bring up your website here. And uh, was this is something I thought was really cool when it came to uh, the schools, the high schools that you've got. One in particular, just because this is hitting my area, more or less, but uh, number 28, you've got the Presbyterian 2 Secondary School out of Fort St. John. What is this exactly? It looks like you've got a little bit of a challenge going for um, high school students. Yeah, so the Logan Lake High School and their shop teacher helped us out on a lot in building Topsy. They helped uh, do a bit of the cab fabrication. And then the, the high school teacher said like, hey, why isn't there anything like this anymore for high schools? And that back when he went to school, the BC Hydro had the BC Hydro EV challenge where high school kids could build EVs. And like, I remember these challenges and you're like, they don't really exist anymore. Like there's nothing like no fun, creative sports thing for people in the trades as much as there should be. Like, yeah, if you're in the lacrosse team, the hockey team, the whatever sports team band, like they'll travel you all across the province. They're like, why aren't they doing it? And they're like, oh, it's expensive. Like we, the schools can't afford to have programs like it. So I'm like, well, all right, well, we'll start our own program. And we got enough money from our YouTube. We'll use the money that comes in from our YouTube. And we'll, we'll buy 10 of these go-kart kits. We got two, three schools interested. We'll, uh, we'll sponsor another seven. Then I said that, and all of a sudden, 100 schools turned up. And I'm like, well, Okay, how <laughs> oh, how am I going to swing that one, eh? <laughs> yeah, oh my God. How am I going to tell 90 schools that they can't do things cool? These kids want to do cool things. They want to build cool things. And we reached out to the community, and we got a lot of local businesses that came out to help sponsor this program. And we were able to get 50 schools, although like 10 of the schools never grabbed their go-karts and so I got to find 10 other schools, but that's notwithstanding. God, dear, we still got 50 go-karts that we can get out to schools where kids can build and compete in a fun, creative design, engineering, racing challenge. And uh, yeah, it was kind of just a cool little project we took on with what limited free time we had, but it, it's definitely one that it, it means a lot to me and something that I, I just really wanted to see the kids get involved in something like this. It's, it's awesome. I think it's just a hell of an idea. Um, so one other thing I'll hit on here for anybody who uh, wants to check out more, because I already mentioned a little bit about your social media presence. And I really think people to either go to your Facebook or even better, you know, you can go to YouTube where you got a whole slew of video press the how you're able to describe everything is super cool if anybody's got curiosity did i just cut there? did i cut out there yeah you did okay either way social media uh youtube facebook um i'd like to kind of just let people know to uh for podcasts i've got a website that i try and get people to go to also uh for checking things out and this is where your episode's going to be Scroll awesome. down, the latest four episodes are always a lot, you know, updated here. And then uh, if you go to the podcast page, then you've got uh, every podcast that I've got. And the nice thing about this is it keeps everything in one area. Because, for example, this last one that I just did is two-part series. And then you can go and check out the trailer the episode for part one and two, you've got all the audio and then you've got a bunch of extra stuff. It's all in one place. And uh, like yours, it's nice, like you, it's, it's sweet to just be able to look at, uh, you know, know where to find it and it's all in one place. And I find YouTube is awesome, 
but it definitely def- doesn't organize everything, right? It's very hard to try and find what you're looking for. But we should set up something like that. That's smart. It's the way to go. Um, definitely. One other thing. I that think I'm, that run. I'm getting a phone call now that I've got to go take that phone call. Uh, sorry, Kevin. This has been absolutely fantastic. Thanks for having me on here. And- Hopefully we can get you up here. And thanks for uh, doing this. Oh, thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Take care. Take care.